E.T.A. Hoffman, The Sandman, narrated by Thorsten Klaus. Nathaniel to Lothair. I know, you are all very uneasy because I have not written for such a long, long time. Mother, to be sure, is angry, and Clara, I dare say, believes I am living here in riot and revelry and quite forgetting my sweet angel, whose image is so deeply engraved upon my heart and mind. But that is not so. Daily and hourly do I think of you all, and my lovely Clara's form comes to gladden me in my dreams, and smiles upon me with her bright eyes, as graciously as she used to do in the days when I went in and out amongst you. Oh, how could I write to you in the distracted state of mind in which I have been, and which, until now, has quite bewildered me? A terrible thing has happened to me, dark forebodings of some awful fate threatening me are spreading themselves out over my head like black clouds, impenetrable to every friendly ray of sunlight. I must now tell you what has taken place. I must, but I see well enough, but only to think upon it makes the wild laughter burst from my lips. Oh, my dear, dear Lothair, what shall I say to make you feel, if only in an inadequate way, that that which happened to me a few days ago could thus really exercise such a hostile and disturbing influence upon my life. Oh, that you were here to see for yourself, but now you will, I suppose, take me for a superstitious ghost seer. In a word, the terrible thing which I have experienced, the fatal effect of which I in vain exert every effort to shake off, is simply that some days ago, namely, on the 30th October, at twelve o'clock at noon, a dealer in weather glasses came into my room and wanted to sell me one of his wares. I bought nothing and threatened to kick him downstairs, whereupon he went away of his own record. You will conclude that it can only be very peculiar relations, relations intimately intertwined with my life that can give significance to this event, and that it must be the person of this unfortunate hawker which has had such a very unimical effect upon me. And so it really is. I will summon up all my faculties in order to narrate to you calmly and patiently as much of the early days of my youth as will suffice to put matters before you in such a way that your keen, sharp intellect may grasp everything clearly and distinctly in bright and living pictures. Just as I am beginning, I hear you laugh and Clara say, What's all this childish nonsense about? Well, laugh at me, laugh heartedly at me, pray do, but good God! My hair is standing on end, and I seem to be entreating you to laugh at me in the same sort of frantic despair in which Franz Moore entreated Daniel to laugh him to scorn. But to my story. Except at dinner we, i.e. I and my brothers and sisters, saw but little of our father all day long. His business, no doubt, took up most of his time. After our evening meal, which, in accordance with an old custom, was served at seven o'clock, we all went, mother with us, into father's room, and took our places around a round table. My father smoked his pipe, drinking a large glass of beer to it. Often he told us many wonderful stories, and got so excited over them that his pipe always went out. I used then to light it for him with a spill, 
and this formed my chief amusement. Often, again, he would give us picture books to look at, whilst he sat silent and motionless in his easy chair, puffing out such dense clouds of smoke that we were all, as it were, enveloped in mist. On such evenings, mother was very sad, and directly it struck nine, she said, Come, children, off to bed, come, the Sandman has come, I see. And I always did seem to hear something trembling upstairs with slow, heavy steps. That must be the Sandman. Once in particular I was very much frightened at this dull trembling and knocking. As mother was leading us out of the room, I asked her, Oh, mamma, but who is this nasty Sandman who always sends us away from papa? What does he look like? Ah, there is no Sandman, my dear child, mother answered. When I say the Sandman has come, I only mean that you are sleepy and can't keep your eyes open, as if somebody had put sand in them. This answer of mother's did not satisfy me. Nay, in my childish mind, the thought clearly unfolded itself that mother denied there was a Sandman, only to prevent us being afraid. Why? I always heard him come upstairs, full of curiosity to learn something more about this Sandman and what he had to do with us children. I at length asked the old woman who acted as my youngest sister's attendant what sort of a man he was, the Sandman. Why, Thaniel, darling, don't you know? she replied. Oh, he is a wicked man who comes to little children when they won't go to bed and throws handfuls of sand in their eyes, so that they jump out of their heads all bloody, and he puts them into a bag and takes them to the half-moon as food for his little ones. And they sit there in a nest and have hooked beaks like owls, and they pick naughty little boys' and girls' eyes out with them. After this, I formed in my own mind a horrible picture of the cruel Sandman. When anything came blundering upstairs at night, I trembled with fear and dismay, and all that my mother could get out of me were the stammered words, The Sandman! The Sandman! Whilst the tears coursed down my cheeks. Then I ran into my bedroom, and the whole night through tormented myself, with the terrible apparition of the Sandman. I was quite old enough to perceive that the old woman's tale about the Sandman and his little one's nest in the half-moon couldn't be altogether true. Nevertheless, the Sandman continued to be for me a fearful incubus, and I was always seized with terror. My blood always ran cold, not only when I heard anybody come up the stairs, but when I heard anybody noisily open my father's room door and go in. Often he stayed away for a long season altogether. Then he would come several times in close succession. This went on for years, without my being able to accustom myself to this fearful apparition without the image of the horrible Sandman growing any fainter in my imagination. His intercourse with my father began to occupy my fancy ever more and more. I was restrained from asking my father about him by an unconquerable shyness. But as the years went on, the desire waxed stronger and stronger within me to fathom my mystery myself and to see the fabulous Sandman. He had been the means of disclosing to me the path of the wonderful and the adventurous, which so easily find lodgment in the mind of the child. I liked nothing better than to hear or read horrible stories of goblins, witches, tom thumbs, and so on. But always at the head of them all stood 
the Sandman, whose picture I scribbled in the most extraordinary and repulsive forms, with both chalk and coal everywhere, on the tables, in cupboard doors and wards. When I was ten years old, my mother removed me from the nursery into a little chamber off the corridor not far from my father's room. We still had to withdraw hastily whenever, on the stroke of nine, the mysterious unknown was heard in the house. As I lay in my little chamber, I could hear him go into father's room, and soon afterwards I fancied there was a fine and peculiar-smelling steam spreading itself through the house. As my curiosity waxed stronger, my resolve to make somehow or other the Sandman's acquaintance took deeper root. Often, when my mother had gone past, I slipped quickly out of my room into the corridor, but I could never see anything, for always before I could reach the place where I could get sight of him, the Sandman was well inside the door. At last, unable to resist the impulse any longer, I determined to conceal myself in father's room and there wait for the Sandman. One evening I perceived from my father's silence and mother's sadness that the Sandman would come. Accordingly, pleading that I was excessively tired, I left the room before nine o'clock and concealed myself in a hiding place, close beside the door. The street door creaked, and slow, heavy, echoing steps crossed the passage towards the stairs. Mother hurried past me with my brothers and sisters. Softly, softly I opened father's room door. He sat, as usual, silent and motionless, with his back towards it. He did not hear me. And in a moment I was in, and behind a curtain drawn before my father's open wardrobe, which stood just inside the room. Nearer and nearer and nearer came the echoing footsteps. There was a strange coughing and shuffling and mumbling outside. My heart beat with expectation and fear. A quick step now close, close beside the door, a noisy rattle of the handle, and the door flies open with a bang. Recovering my courage with an effort, I take a cautious peep out. In the middle of the room, in front of my father, stands the Sandman, the bright light of the lamp falling full upon his face. The Sandman, the terrible Sandman, is the old advocat Coppelius, who often comes to dine with us. But the most hideous figure could not have awakened greater trepidation in my heart than this Coppelius did. Picture to yourself a large, broad-shouldered man with an immensely big head, a face the color of yellow ochre, gray bushy eyebrows, from beneath which two piercing, greenish, cat-like eyes glittered and a prominent Roman nose hanging over his upper lip. His distorted mouth was often screwed up into a malicious smile. Then two dark red spots appeared on his cheeks, and a strange hissing noise proceeded from between his tightly clenched teeth. He always wore an ash-gray coat of an old-fashioned cut, a waistcoat, of the same, and never extremities to match, but black stockings and buckles set with stones on his shoes. His little wig scarcely extended beyond the crown of his head, his hair was curled around high up above his big red ears, and plastered to his temples with cosmetic, and a broad closed hair back stood out prominently from his neck, so that you could see the silver buckle that fastened his folded neck cloth. Altogether, he was a most disagreeable and horribly 
ugly figure. But what we children detested most of all was his big, coarse, hairy hands. We could never fancy anything that he had once touched. This he had noticed, and so, whenever our good mother quietly placed a piece of cake or sweet fruit on our plates, he, delighted to touch it under some pretext or other, until the bright tears stood in our eyes. And from disgust and loathing we lost the enjoyment of the tidbit that was intended to please us. And he did just the same thing when father gave us a glass of sweet wine on holidays. Then he would quickly pass his hand over it or even sometimes raise the glass to his blue lips and he laughed quite sardonically when all we dared do was to express our vexation in stiffed sobs. He habitually called us the little brutes and when he was present we might not utter a sound and we cursed the ugly spiteful man who deliberately and intentionally spoiled all our little pleasures. Mother seemed to dislike this hateful Coppelius as much as we did, for as soon as he appeared, her cheerfulness and bright and natural manner were transformed into sad, gloomy seriousness. Father treated him as if he were a being of some higher race, whose ill manners were to be tolerated, whilst no efforts Oh, to be spared to keep him in good humour. He had only to give a slight hint, and his favourite dishes were cooked for him, and rare wine uncorked. As soon as I saw this Coppelius, therefore, the fearful and hideous thought arose in my mind that he, and he alone, must be the Sandman. But I no longer conceived of the Sandman as the bugbear in the old nurse fable who fetched children's eyes and took them to the half-moon as food for his little ones, no, but as an ugly, spectre-like fiend, bringing trouble and misery and ruin, both temporal and everlasting, everywhere, wherever he appeared. I was spellbound on the spot, at the risk of being discovered, and, as I well enough knew of being severely punished, I remained as I was with my head thrust through the curtains listening. My father received Coppelius in a ceremonious manner. Come to work, cried the latter, in a hoarse, snarling voice, throwing off his coat. Gloomily and silently my father took off his dressing gown and both put on long black smock frocks. Where they took them from I forgot to notice. Father opened the folding doors of a cupboard in a wall. But I saw that what I had so long taken to be a cupboard was really a dark recess, in which was a little hearth. Coppelius approached it, and a blue flame crackled upwards from it. Round about were all kinds of strange utensils. Good God! As my old father bent down over the fire, how different he looked. His gentle and venerable features seemed to be drawn up by some dreadful, convulsive pain into an ugly, repulsive, satanic mask. He looked like Coppelius. Coppelius plied the red-hot tongs and drew bright glowing masses out of the thick smoke and began assiduously to hammer them. I fancied that there were men's faces visible round about, but without eyes, having ghastly deep black holes where the eyes should have been. Eyes here, eyes here, cried Coppelius in a hollow, sepulchral voice. My blood ran cold with horror. I screamed and tumbled out of my hiding place into the floor. Coppelius immediately seized upon me. You little brute! You little brute! He bleated, grinding his teeth. Then, snatching me up, he threw me on the hearth so that the flames began to singe my hair. 
Now we've got eyes, eyes, a beautiful pair of children's eyes, he whispered, and thrusting his hands into the flames, he took out some red-hot grains and was about to strew them into my eyes. Then my father clasped his hands and entreated him, saying, Master, master, let my Nathaniel keep his eyes. Oh, do let him keep them. Coppelius laughed shrilly and replied, Ha, 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 well then, the boy may keep his eyes and wine and peel his way through the world. But we will now at any rate observe the mechanism of the hand and the foot. And therewith he roughly laid hold upon me, so that my joints cracked, and twisted my hands and my feet, pulling them now this way and now that. That's not quite right altogether. It's better as it was. The old fellow knew what he was about. Those lisped and hissed Coppelius, but all around me grew black and dark. A sudden, convulsive pain shot through all my nerves and bones. I knew nothing more. I felt a soft, warm breath fanning my cheek. I awakened as if out of the sleep of death. My mother was bending over me. Is the Sandman still there? I stammered. No, my dear child, he's been gone a long, long time. He will not hurt you. Doe spoke my mother as she kissed her recovered darling and pressed him to her heart. But why should I tire you, my dear Lofair? Why do I dwell at such length on these details, when there so much remains to be said? Enough. I was detected in my eavesdropping, and roughly handled by Coppelius. Fear and terror had brought on a violent fever, of which I lay ill several weeks. Is, is the Sandman still there? These were the first words I uttered on coming to myself again, the first sign of my recovery, of my safety. Thus, you see, I have only to relate to you the most terrible moment of my youth, for you to thoroughly understand that it must not be ascribed to the weakness of my eyesight if all that I see is colourless, but to the fact that a mysterious destiny has hung a dark veil of clouds about my life, which I shall perhaps only break through when I die. Coppelius did not show himself again. It was reported he had left the town. It was about a year later when, in pursuance of the old unchanged custom, we sat around the round table in the evening. Father was in very good spirits and was telling us amusing tales about his youthful travels. As it was striking nine, we all at once heard the street door creak on its hinges, and slow Ponderous steps echoed across the passage and up the stairs. That is Coppelius, said my mother, turning pale. Yes, it is Coppelius, replied my father in a faint, broken voice. The tears started from my mother's eyes. But father, father, she cried, must it be so? This is the last time, he replied. This is the last time he will come to me, I promise you. Go now, go and take the children. Go, go to bed. Good night. As for me, I felt as if I were converted into cold, heavy stone. I could not get my breath. As I stood there, immovable, my mother seized me by the arm. Come, Nathaniel, do come along. I suffered myself to be led away. I went into my room. Be a good boy and keep quiet. 
mother called after me. Get into bed and go to sleep. But, tortured by indescribable fear and uneasiness, I could not close my eyes. That hateful, hideous Coppelius stood before me with his glittering eyes, smiling maliciously down upon me. In vain did I strive to banish the image. Somewhere, about midnight, there was a terrific crack, as if a cannon were being fired off. The whole house shook. Something went rustling and cluttering past my door. The house door was pulled to with a bang. That is Coppelius, I cried, terror-struck, and leaped out of bed. Then I heard a wild, heart-trending scream. I rushed into my father's room. The door stood open, and clouds of suffocating smoke came rolling towards me. The servant-maid shouted, Oh, my master, my master! On the floor in front of the smoking hearth lay my father, dead. His face burned black and fearfully distorted, my sisters weeping and moaning around him, and my mother lying near them in a swoon. Coppelius, you atrocious fiend, you've killed my father, I shouted. My senses left me. Two days later, when my father was placed in his coffin, his features were mild and gentle again, as they had been when he was alive. I found great consolation in the thought that his association with the diabolical Coppelius could not have ended in his everlasting ruin. Our neighbors had been awakened by the explosion. The affair got talked about and came before the magisterial authorities, who wished to cite Coppelius to clear himself, but he had disappeared from the place, leaving no traces behind him. Now when I tell you, my dear friend, that the weather glass hawk I spoke of was the villain Coppelius, you will not blame me for seeing impending mischief in his inauspicious reappearance. He was differently dressed, but Coppelius' figure and features are too deeply impressed upon my mind for me to be capable of making a mistake in the matter. Moreover, he has not even changed his name. He proclaims himself here, I learn, to be a Piedmontese mechanician and styles himself Giuseppe Coppola. I am resolved to enter the lists against him and revenge my father's death. Let the consequences be what they may. Don't say a word to mother about the reappearance of this odious monster. Give my love to my darling Clara. I will write to her when I am in a somewhat calmer frame of mind. Adieu, etc. Clara to Nathaniel You are right, you have not written to me for a very long time, but nevertheless I believe that I still retain a place in your mind and thoughts. It is a proof that you were thinking a good deal about me when you were sending off your last letter to Brother Lothair, for instead of directing it to him, you directed it to me. With joy I tore open the envelope and did not perceive the mistake until I read the words, Oh, my dear, dear Lothair, now I know I ought not to have read any more of the letter, but ought to have given it to my brother. But as you have so often in innocent raillery made it a sort of reproach against me that I possessed such a calm and, for a woman, cool-headed temperament that I should be like the woman we read of, if the house was threatening to tumble down, I should, before hastily fleeing, stop to smooth down a crumble in the window curtains. I need hardly tell you the beginning of your letter quite upset me. I could scarcely breathe. There was a bright mist before my eyes. Oh, my darling Nathaniel, what could this terrible thing be that had happened? Separation from you, 
never to see you again. The thought was like a sharp knife in my heart. I read on and on. Your description of that horrid Coppelius made my flesh creep. I now learned for the first time what a terrible and violent death your good old father died. Brother Lothair, to whom I handed over his property, so to comfort me, but with little success. That horrid weather-glass hawker Giuseppe Coppola followed me everywhere, and I am almost ashamed to confess it, but he was able to disturb my sound and in general calm sleep as all sorts of wonderful dream shapes. But soon, the next day, I saw everything in a different light. Oh, do not be angry with me, my best beloved, if, despite your strange presentment that Coppelius will do you some mischief, Lothair tells you I am in quite as good spirits and just the same as ever. I will frankly confess, it seems to me that all that was fearsome and terrible of which you speak existed only in your own self, and that the real true outer world had but little to do with it. I can quite admit that old Coppelius may have been highly obnoxious to your children, but your real detestation of him arose from the fact that he hated children. Naturally enough, the gruesome Sandman of the old nurse's story was associated in your childish mind with old Coppelius, who, even though you had not believed in the Sandman, would have been to you a ghostly bugbear, especially dangerous to children. His mysterious labors along with your father at night time where, I dare say, nothing more than secret experiments in alchemy, with which your mother could not be over well pleased, owing to the large sums of money that most likely were thrown away upon them. And besides, your father, his mind full of the deceptive striving after higher knowledge, may probably have become rather indifferent to his family, as so often happens in the case of such experimentalists. So also it is equally probable that your father brought about his death by his own imprudence, and that Coppelius is not to blame for it. I must tell you that yesterday I asked our experienced neighbor, the chemist, whether in experiments of this kind an explosion could take place which would have a momentarily fatal effect. He said, Oh, certainly, and described to me in his prolix and circumstantial way how it could be occasioned, mentioning at the same time so many strange and funny words that I could not remember them at all. Now I know you will be angry at your Clara and will say, of the mysterious, which often clasps man in its invisible arms, there is not a ray, can find its way into this cold heart. She sees only the varied surface of the things of the world, and, like the little child, is pleased with the golden glittering fruit, at the kernel of which lies the fatal poison. Oh, my beloved Nathaniel, do you believe then that the intuitive prescience of a dark power working within us to our own ruin cannot exist also in minds which are cheerful, natural, free from care? But please forgive me that I, a simple girl, presume in any way to indicate to you what I really think of such an inward strife. After all, I should not find the proper words, and you would only laugh at me, not because my thoughts were stupid, but because I was so foolish as to attempt to tell them to you. If there is a dark and hostile power which 
traitorously fixes a threat in our hearts in order that, laying hold of it and drawing us by means of it along a dangerous road to ruin, which otherwise we should not have trod, if, I say, there is such a power, it must assume within us a form like ourselves. Nay, it must be ourselves. For only in that way can we believe in it, and only so understood do we yield to it so far that it is able to accomplish its secret purpose. So long as we have sufficient firmness, fortified by cheerfulness, to always acknowledge foreign hostile influences for what they really are, whilst we quietly pursue the path pointed out to us by both inclination and calling, then this mysterious power perishes in its futile struggles to attain the form which is to be the reflected image of ourselves. It is also certain, Lothair adds, that if we have once voluntarily given ourselves up to this dark physical power, it often reproduces within us the strange forms which the outer world throws in our way, so that thus it is we ourselves who engender within ourselves the spirit, which by some remarkable delusion we imagine to speak in that outer form. It is the phantom of our own self whose intimate relationship with and whose powerful influence upon our soul either plunges us into hell or elevates us to heaven. Thus you will see, my beloved Nathaniel, that I and Brother Lothair have well talked over the subject of dark powers and forces, and now, after I have with some difficulty written down the principal results of our discussion, they seem to me to contain many really profound thoughts. Lothair's last words, however, I don't quite understand altogether. I only dimly guess what he means, and yet I cannot help thinking it is all very true. I beg you, dear, strive to forget the ugly advocate Coppelius, as well as the weather glass hawker Giuseppe Coppola. Try and convince yourself that these foreign influences can have no power over you, that it is only the belief in their hostile power which can in reality make them dangerous to you. If every line of your letter did not betray the violent excitement of your mind, and if I did not sympathize with your condition from the bottom of my heart, I could in truth jest about the advocate Sandman and Weatherglass Hawker Coppelius. Pluck up your spirits. Be cheerful. I have resolved to appear to you as your guardian angel, if that ugly man Coppola should dare take it into his head to bother you in your dreams and drive him away with a good, hearty laugh. I'm not afraid of him in his nasty hands, not the least little bit. I won't let him either as advocate spoil any dainty tidbit I've taken or as Sandman rob me of my eyes. My darling, darling Nathaniel, eternally, you, etc., etc. Nathaniel to Lothair I'm very sorry that Clara opened and read my last letter to you. Of course, the mistake is to be attributed to my own absence of mind. She has written me a very deep philosophical letter, proving conclusively that Coppelius and Coppola only exist in my own mind and are phantoms of my own self which will at once be dissipated as soon as I look upon them in that light. In very truth, one can hardly believe that the mind, which so often sparkles in those bright, 
beautifully smiling, childlike eyes of hers, like a sweet, lovely dream, could draw such subtle and jolastic distinctions. She also mentions your name. You have been talking about me. I suppose you have been giving her lectures, since she sifts and refines everything so acutely. But enough of this. I must now tell you it is most certain that the weatherglass hawker Giuseppe Coppola is not the advocate Coppelius. I am attending the lectures of our recently appointed professor of physics, who, like the distinguished naturalist, is called Spallanzani and is of Italian origin. He has known Coppola for many years, and it is also easy to tell from his accent that he really is a Piedmontese. Coppelius was a German, though no honest German, I fancy. Nevertheless, I'm not quite satisfied. You and Clara will perhaps take me for a gloomy dreamer, but no how can I get rid of this impression which Coppelius' cursed face made up on me. I'm glad to learn from Spallanzani that he has left the town. This Professor Spallanzani is a very queer fish. He is a little fat man with prominent cheekbones, thin nose, projecting lips and small piercing eyes. You cannot get a better picture of him than by turning over one of the Berlin pocket almanacs and looking at Cagliostro's portrait engraved by Chodovicki. Spallanzani looks just like him. Once lately, as I went up the steps to his house, I perceived that beside the curtain, which generally covered a glass door, there was a small chink. What it was that excited my curiosity, I cannot explain, but I looked through. In the room I saw a female, tall, very slender, but of perfect proportions and splendidly dressed, sitting at a little table on which she had placed both her arms, her hands being folded together. She sat opposite the door, so that I could easily see her angelically beautiful face. She did not appear to notice me, and there was, moreover, a strangely fixed look about her eyes. I might almost say they appeared as if they had no power of vision. I thought she was sleeping with her eyes open. I felt quite uncomfortable, and so I slipped away quietly into the professor's lecture room, which was close at hand. Afterwards, I learned that the figure which I had seen was Balanzani's daughter, Olympia, whom he keeps locked in a most wicked and uncountable way, and no man is ever allowed to come near her. Perhaps. However, there is, after all, something peculiar about her. Perhaps she is an idiot or something of that sort. But why am I telling you all this? I could have told you it all better and more in detail when I see you. For in a fortnight I shall be amongst you. I must see my dear sweet angel, my Clara, again. Then the little bit of ill-temper which, I must confess, took possession of me after her fearfully sensible letter, will be blown away. And that is the reason why I am not writing to her as well today. With all best wishes, etc. Nothing more strange and extraordinary can be imagined, gracious reader, than what happened to my poor friend, the young student Nathaniel, and which I have undertaken to relate to you. Have you ever lived to experience anything that completely took possession of your heart and mind and thoughts to the utter exclusion of everything else? All was seething and boiling within you, your blood heated to fever pitch, leaped through your veins and inflamed your cheeks. Your gaze was so peculiar, as if seeking to grasp in empty space forms not seen of any other eye, 
and all your words ended in sighs betokening some mystery. Then your friends ask you, What's the matter with you, my dear friend? What do you see? And, wishing to describe the inner pictures in all their vivid colors, with their lights and their shades, you in vain struggle to find words with which to express yourself. But you felt as if you must gather up all the events that had happened, wonderful, splendid, terrible, jocose and awful in the very first word, so that the whole might be revealed by a single electric discharge, so to speak. Yet every word and all that partook of the nature of communication by intelligible sounds seemed to be colorless, cold and dead. Then you try and try again and stutter and stammer, whilst your friends prosy questions strike like icy winds upon your heart's hot fire until they extinguish it. But if, like a bold painter, you had first sketched in a few audacious strokes the outline of the picture you had in your soul, you would then easily have been able to deepen and intensify the colors one after the other, until the varied throng of living figures carried your friends away, and they, like you, saw themselves in the midst of the scene that had proceeded out of your own soul. Strictly speaking, indulgent reader, I must indeed confess to you, nobody has asked me for the history of young Nathaniel. But you are very well aware that I belong to that remarkable class of authors who, when they are bearing anything about in their minds in the manner I have just described, feel as if everybody who comes near them, and also the whole world to boot, were asking, Oh, what is it? Oh, do tell us, my good sir. Hence I was most powerfully impelled to narrate to you Nathaniel's ominous life. My soul was full of the elements of wonder and extraordinary peculiarity in it. But for this very reason, and because it was necessary in the very beginning to dispose you, indulgent reader, to bear with what is fantastic, and that is not a little thing, I racked my brain to find a way of commencing the story in a significant and original manner calculated to arrest your attention. To begin with, once upon a time, the best beginning for a story seemed to me too tame. With, in a small country town as lived, rather better, at any rate, allowing plenty of room to work up to the climax, or to plunge at once in media's rest. Go to the devil, cried the student Nathaniel, his eyes blazing wildly with rage and fear when the weatherglass hawker Giuseppe Coppola, well, that is what I really had written when I thought I detected something of this ridiculous in Nathaniel's wild glance, and the history is anything but laughable. I could not find any words which seemed fitted to reflect in even the feeblest degree the brightness of the colors of my mental vision. I determined not to begin at all, so I pray you, gracious reader, accept the three letters which my friend Lofair has been so kind as to communicate to me as the outline of the picture into which I will endeavor to introduce more and more color as I proceed with my narrative. Perhaps, like a good portrait painter, I may succeed in depicting more than one figure in such wise that you will recognize it as a good likeness without being acquainted with the original, and feel as if you had very often seen the original with your own bodily eyes. Perhaps, too, you will then believe 
that nothing is more wonderful, nothing more fantastic than real life, and that all that a writer can do is to present it as a dark reflection from a dim, cut mirror. In order to make the very commencement more intelligible, it is necessary to add to the letters that, soon after the death of Nathaniel's father, Clara and Lothair, the children of a distant relative who had likewise died, leaving them orphans, were taken by Nathaniel's mother into her own house. Clara and Nathaniel conceived a warm affection for each other, against which not the slightest objection in the world could be urged. When therefore Nathaniel left home to prosecute his studies in G, they were betrothed. It is from G that his last letter is written, where he is attending the lectures of Spallanzani, the distinguished professor of physics. I might now proceed comfortably with my narration, did not at this moment Clara's image rise up so vividly before my eyes that I cannot turn them away from it, just as I never could when she looked upon me and smiled so sweetly. Nowhere would she have passed for beautiful. That was the unanimous opinion of all who professed to have any technical knowledge of beauty. But whilst architects praised the pure proportions of her figure and form, painters averred that her neck, shoulders and bosom were almost too chastely modelled. And yet, on the other hand, one and all were in love with her glorious Magdalene hair and talked a good deal of nonsense about batoni-like colouring. One of them, a veritable romanticist, strangely enough lightened her eyes to a lake by Ruiz Dael, in which is reflected the pure azure of the cloudless sky, the beauty of woods and flowers, and all the bright and varied life of a living landscape. Poets and musicians went still further and said, What's all this talk about seas and reflections? How can we look upon the girl without feeling that wonderful heavenly songs and melodies beam upon us from her eyes, penetrating deep down into our hearts, till all becomes awake and throbbing with emotion? And if we cannot sing anything at all possible then, why? We are not worth much, and this we can also plainly read in the rare smile which flits around her lips when we have the hardihood to squeak out something in her presence which we pretend to call singing in spite of the fact that it is nothing more than a few single notes confusedly linked together. And it really was so. Clara had the powerful fancy of a bright, innocent, unaffected child, a woman's deep and sympathetic heart, and an understanding, clear, sharp, and discriminating. Dreamers and visionaries had but a bad time of it with her, for without saying very much, she was not by nature of a talkative disposition. She plainly asked, by a calm, steady look and rare, ironical smile. How can you imagine, my dear friends, that I can take these fleeting shadowy images for true living and breathing forms? For this reason, many found fault with her as being cold, prosaic and devoid of feelings. Others, however, who had reached a clearer and deeper conception of life, were extremely fond of the intelligent, childlike, large-hearted girl. But none had such an affection for her as Nathaniel, who was a zealous and cheerful cultivator of the fields of science and art. Clara clung to her lover with all her heart. The first clouds she encountered in life were when he had to separate from her. 
With what delight did she fly into his arms when, as he had promised in his last letter to Lothair, he really came back to his native town and entered his mother's room. And, as Nathaniel had foreseen, the moment he saw Clara again, he no longer thought about either the advocate Coppelius or her sensible letter. His ill humour had quite disappeared. Nevertheless, Nathaniel was right when he told his friend Lothair that the repulsive vendor of weather glasses, Coppola, had exercised a fatal and disturbing influence upon his life. It was quite patent to all, for even during the first few days he showed that he was completely and entirely changed. He gave himself up to gloomy reveries and, moreover, acted so strangely they had never observed anything at all like it in him before. Everything, even his own life, was to him but dreams and presentiments. His constant theme was that every man who delusively imagined himself to be free was merely the plaything of the cruel sport of mysterious powers, and it was vain for man to resist them. He must humbly submit to whatever destiny had discreet for him. He went so far as to maintain that it was foolish to believe that a man could do anything in art or science of his own accord. For the inspiration in which alone any true artistic work could be done did not proceed from the spirit within outwards, but was the result of the operation directed inwards of some higher principle existing without and beyond ourselves. This mystic extravagance was in the highest degree repugnant to Clara's clear, intelligent mind, but it seemed vain to enter upon any attempt at refutation. Yet, when Nathaniel went on to prove that Coppelius was the evil principle which had entered into him and taken possession of him at the time he was listening behind the curtain, and that this hateful demon would in some terrible way ruin the happiness, then Clara grew grave and said, Yes, Nathaniel, you are right. Coppelius is an evil principle. He can do dreadful things, as bad as could a satanic power which should assume a living physical form. But only, only if you do not banish him from your mind and thoughts. So long as you believe in him, he exists and is at work. Your belief in him is the only power. Whereupon Nathaniel, quite angry because Clara would only grant the existence of the demon in his own mind, began to dilate at large upon the whole mystic doctrine of devils and awful powers. But Clara abruptly broke off the theme by making, to Nathaniel's very great disgust, some quite commonplace remark. Such deep mysteries are sealed books to cold, unsusceptible characters, he thought, without being clearly conscious to himself that he counted Clara amongst these inferior natures. And, accordingly, he did not remit his efforts to initiate her into these mysteries. In the morning, when she was helping to prepare breakfast, he would take her stand beside her and read all sorts of mystic books to her, until she begged him, But, my dear Nathaniel, I shall have to scold you as the evil principle which exercises a fatal influence upon my coffee. For if I do as you wish, and let things go their own way, and look into your eyes whilst you read, the coffee will all boil over into the fire, and you will none of you get any breakfast. Then Nathaniel hastily banged the book to and ran away in great displeasure to his own room. Formerly he had possessed a peculiar talent for writing pleasing, sparkling tales, which Clara took the greatest delight in listening to. 
but now his productions were gloomy, unintelligible, and wanting in form, so that, although Clara, out of forbearance towards him, did not say so, he nevertheless felt how very little interest she took in them. There was nothing that Clara disliked so much as what was tedious. At such times her intellectual sleepiness was not to be overcome. It was betrayed both in her glances and in her words. Nathaniel's effusions were, in truth, exceedingly tedious. His ill humor at Clara's cold, prosaic temperament continued to increase. Clara could not conceal her distaste of his dark, gloomy, varying mysticism, and those both began to be more and more estranged from each other without exactly being aware of it themselves. The image of the ugly Coppelius had, as Nathaniel was obliged to confess to himself, faded considerably in his fancy, and it often cost him great pains to present him in vivid colours in his literary efforts, in which he played the part of the goal of destiny. At length it entered into his head to make his dismal presentiment that Coppelius would ruin his happiness the subject of a poem. He made himself and Clara, united by true love, the central figures, but represented a black hand as being from time to time thrust into their life and plucking out a joy that had blossomed for them. At length, as they were standing at the altar, the terrible Coppelius appeared and touched Clara's lovely eyes, which leaped into Nathaniel's own bosom, burning and hissing like bloody sparks. Then Coppelius laid hold upon him and hurled him into a blazing circle of fire, which spun round with the speed of a whirlwind and, storming and blustering, dashed away with him. The fearful noise it made was like a furious hurricane, lashing the foaming sea waves, until they rise up like black, white-headed giants in the midst of the raging struggle. But through the midst of the savage fury of the tempest he heard Clara's voice calling, Can you not see me, dear? Coppelius has deceived you. They were not my eyes which burned so in your bosom. They were fiery drops of your own heart's blood. Look at me. I have got my own eyes still. Nathaniel thought, Yes, that is Clara, and I am hers for ever. Then this thought laid a powerful grasp upon the fiercy circle so that it stood still. And the riotous Turmoil died away, rumbling down a dark abyss. Nathaniel looked into Clara's eyes, but it was Death, whose gaze rested so kindly upon him. Whilst Nathaniel was writing this work, he was very quiet and sober-minded. He filed and polished every line, and as he had chosen to submit himself to the limitations of meter, he did not rest until all was pure and musical. When, however, he had at length finished it and read it aloud to himself, he was seized with horror and awful dread, and he screamed, Whose hideous voice is this? But he soon came to see in it again nothing beyond a very successful poem, and he confidently believed it would enkindle Clara's cold temperament though to what end she should be thus aroused was not quite clear to his own mind nor yet what would be the real purpose served by tormenting her with these dreadful pictures which prophesied a terrible and ruinous end to her affection nathaniel and clara sat in his mother's little garden clara was bright and cheerful since for three entire days her lover, who had been busy writing his poem, had not teased her with his dreams or forebodings. 
Nathaniel, too, spoke in a gay and vivacious way of things of merry import, as he formerly used to do, so that Clara said, Ah, now I have you again. We have driven away that ugly Coppelius, you see. Then it suddenly occurred to him that he had got the poem in his pocket, which he wished to read to her. He at once took out the manuscript and began to read. Clara, anticipating something tedious as usual, prepared to submit to the infliction and calmly resumed her knitting. But as the sombre clouds rose up darker and darker, she let her knitting fall on her lap and sat with her eyes fixed in a set stare upon Nathaniel's face. He was quite carried away by his own work. The fire of enthusiasm colored his cheeks a deep red, and tears started from his eyes. At length he concluded, groaning and showing great lassitude. Grasping Clara's hand, he sighed as if he were being utterly melted in inconsolable grief. Oh, Clara, Clara! She drew him softly to her heart and said in a low but very grave and impressive tone, Nathaniel, my darling Nathaniel, throw that foolish, senseless, stupid thing into the fire. Then Nathaniel leaped indignantly to his feet, crying as he pushed Clara from him. You damned lifeless automation! He rushed away. Clara was cut to the heart and wept bitterly. Oh, he has never loved me, for he does not understand me. She sobbed. Lothair entered the arbor. Clara was obliged to tell him all that had taken place. He was passionately fond of his sister, and every word of her complaint fell like a spark upon his heart, so that the displeasure which he had long entertained against the dreamy friend Nathaniel was kindled into furious anger. He hastened to find Nathaniel and upbraided him in harsh words for his irrational behavior towards his beloved sister. The fiery Nathaniel answered him in the same style. A fantastic, crack-brained fool! was retaliated with a miserable, common, everyday sort of fellow. A meeting was the inevitable consequence. They agreed to meet on the following morning behind the garden wall and fight, according to the custom of the students of the place, with sharp rapiers. They went about silent and gloomy. Clara had both heard and seen the violent quarrel, and also observed the fencing master bring the rapiers in the dusk of the evening. She had a presentiment of what was to happen. They both appeared at the appointed place, wrapped up in the same gloomy silence, and threw off their coats. Their eyes flaming with the bloodthirsty light of pugnacity, they were about to begin their contest, when Clara burst through the garden door. Sobbing, she screamed, You savage, terrible men! Cut me down before you attack each other, for how can I live when my lover has slain my brother, or my brother has slain my lover? Lothair let his weapon fall and gazed silently upon the ground, whilst Nathaniel's heart was rent with sorrow, and all the affection which he had felt for this lovely Clara in the happiest days of her golden youth was awakened within him. His murderous weapon, too, fell from his hand. He threw himself at Clara's feet. Oh, can you ever forgive me, my only, my dearly loved Clara? Can you, my dear brother Lothair, also forgive me? Lothair was touched by his friend's great distress. The three young people embraced each other amidst endless tears, and swore never again.
to break their bond of love and fidelity. Nathaniel felt as if a heavy burden that had been weighing him down to the earth was now rolled from off him. Nay, as if by offering resistance to the dark power which had possessed him, he had rescued his own self from the ruin which had threatened him. Three happy days he now spent amidst the loved ones, and then returned to G, where he had still a year to stay before settling down in his native town for life. Everything having reverence to Coppelius had been concealed from the mother, for they knew she could not think of him without horror, since she as well as Nathaniel believed him to be guilty of causing her husband's death. When Nathaniel came to the house where he lived, he was greatly astonished to find it burned down to the ground, so that nothing but the bare outer walls were left standing amidst a heap of ruins. Although the fire had broken out in the laboratory of the chemist who lived on the ground floor and had therefore spread upwards, some of Nathaniel's bold, active friends had succeeded in time in forcing away into his room in the upper story and saving his books and manuscripts and instruments. They had carried them all uninjured into another house, where they engaged a room for him. This he now at once took possession of. That he lived opposite Professor Spallanzani did not strike him particularly, nor did it occur to him as anything more singular that he could as he observed, by looking out of his window, see straight into the room where Olympia often sat alone. Her figure he could plainly distinguish, although her features were uncertain and confused. It did at length occur to him, however, that she remained for hours together in the same position, in which he had first discovered her through the glass door, sitting at a little table, without any occupation whatever. And it was evident that she was constantly gazing across in his direction. He could not but confess to himself that he had never seen a finer figure. However, with Clara mistress of his heart, he remained perfectly unaffected by Olympia's stiffness and apathy and it was only occasionally that he sent a fugitive glance over his compendium across to her. That was all. He was writing to Clara. A light tap came at the door. At his summons to come in, Coppola's repulsive face appeared peeping in. Nathaniel felt his heart beat with trepidation. But Recollecting what Spallanzani had told him about his fellow countryman Coppola and what he had himself so faithfully promised his beloved in respect to the Sandman Coppelius, he was ashamed at himself for his childish fear of spectres. Accordingly, he controlled himself with an effort and said as quietly and as calmly as he possibly could, I don't want to buy any weather glasses, my good friend. You had better go elsewhere. Then Coppola came right into the room and said in a hoarse voice, screwing up his wide mouth into a hideous smile, whilst his little eyes flashed keenly from beneath his long grey eyelashes. What? Nee weather glass, nee weather glass, I've got fine eyes as well, fine eyes. Affrighted, Nathaniel cried, You stupid man, how can you have eyes, eyes, eyes? But Coppola, laying aside his weather glasses, thrust his hands into his big 
coat pockets and brought out several spy glasses and spectacles and put them on a table. There, there, spectacles, spectacles to put the nose. Damn my eyes, fine eyes. And he continued to produce more and more spectacles from his pockets until the table began to gleam and flash all over. Thousands of eyes were looking and blinking convulsively and staring up at Nathaniel. He could not avert his gaze from the table. Coppola went on heaping up his spectacles, whilst Wilder and Eva Wilder, burning flashes, crossed through and through each other and darted their blood-red rays into Nathaniel's breast. Quite overcome and frantic with terror, he shouted, Stop! Stop! You terrible men! And he seized Coppola by the arm which he had again thrust into his pocket in order to bring out still more spectacles, although the whole table was covered all over with them. With a harsh, disagreeable laugh, Coppola gently freed himself, and with the words, So went none, well here, fine glass, he swept all his spectacles together and put them back, into his coat pockets, whilst from a breast pocket he produced a great number of larger and smaller perspectives. As soon as the spectacles were gone, Nathaniel recovered his equanimity again, and, bending his thoughts upon Clara, he clearly discerned that the gruesome incubus had proceeded only from himself, as also that Coppola was a right honest mechanician and optician, and far from being Coppelius dreaded double and ghost. And then, besides, none of the glasses which Coppola now placed on a table had anything at all singular about them, at least nothing so weird as the spectacles. So, in order to square accounts with himself, Nathaniel now really determined to buy something of the man. He took up a small, very beautifully cut pocket perspective, and by way of proving it looked through the window. Never before in his life had he had a glass in his hands that brought out things so clearly and sharply and distinctly. Involuntarily he directed the glass upon Spallanzani's room. Olympia sat at the little table as usual, her arms laid upon it and her hands folded. Now he saw for the first time the regular and exquisite beauty of her features. The eyes, however, seemed to him to have a singular look of fixity and lifelessness. But as he continued to look closer and more carefully through the glass, he fancied a light like humid moonbeams, came into them. It seemed as if their power of vision was now being enkindled. Their glances shone with ever-increasing vivacity. Nathaniel remained standing at the window, as if glued to the spot by a wizard's spell, his gaze reverted unchangeably upon the divinely beautiful Olympia. A coughing and shuffling of the feet awakened him out of his enchaining dream, as it were. Coppola stood behind him. Three Cecchini! Nathaniel had completely forgotten the optician. He hastily paid the sum demanded. Ain't it fine glass, fine glass! asked Coppola in his harsh, unpleasant voice, smiling sardonically. Yes, 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 rejoined Nathaniel impatiently. Adieu, my good friend. But Coppola did not leave the room without casting many peculiar side glances upon Nathaniel, and a young student heard him laughing loudly on the stairs. 
Ah, well, thought he, he's laughing at me because I've paid him too much for this little perspective, because I've given him too much money, and that's it. As he softly murmured these words, he fancied he detected a gasping sigh as of a dying man stealing awfully through the room. His heart stopped beating with fear. But to be sure, he had heaved a deep sigh himself. It was quite plain. Clara's quite right, said he to himself, in holding me to be an incurable ghost seer. And yet, it's very ridiculous. I, more than ridiculous, that the stupid thought of having paid Coppola too much for his glass should cause me this strange anxiety. I can't see any reason for it. Now he sat down to finish his letter to Clara, but a glance through the window showed him Olympia, still in her former posture. Urged by an irresistible impulse, he jumped up and seized Coppola's perspective. Nor could he tear himself away from the fascinating Olympia until his friend and brother, Siegmund, called for him to go to Professor Spallanzani's lecture. The curtains before the door of the all-important room were closely drawn, so that he could not see Olympia. Nor could he even see her from his own room during the two following days, notwithstanding that he scarcely ever left his window and maintained a scarce interrupted watch through Cobbler's perspective upon her room. On the third day, curtains even were drawn across the window. Plunged into the depths of despair, goaded by longing and ardent desire, he hurried outside the walls of the town. Olympia's image hovered about his path in the air and stepped forth out of the bushes and peeped up at him with large and lustrous eyes from the bright surface of the brook. Clara's image was completely faded from his mind. He had no thoughts except for Olympia. He uttered his love plaints aloud and in a lachrymose tone, Oh, my glorious, noble star of love, have you only risen to vanish again? and leave me in the darkness and hopelessness of night? Returning home, he became aware that there was a good deal of noisy bustle going on in Spallanzani's house. All the doors stood wide open. Men were taking in all kinds of gear and furniture. The windows of the first floor were all lifted off their hinges. Busy maid servants with immense hair brooms were driving backwards and forwards, dusting and sweeping, whilst within could be heard the knocking and hammering of carpenters and upholsterers. Utterly astonished, Nathaniel stood still in the street. Then Siegmund joined him, laughing, and said, Well, what do you say to our old Spallanzani? Nathaniel assured him that he could not say anything, since he knew not what it all meant. To his great astonishment, he could hear, however, that they were turning the quiet, gloomy house almost inside out, with their dusting and cleaning and making of alterations. Then he learned from Siegmund that Spallanzani intended giving a great concert and ball on the following day, and that half the university was invited. It was generally reported that Spallanzani was going to let his daughter Olympia, whom he had so long so jealously guarded from every eye, make a first appearance. Nathaniel received an invitation. At the appointed hour, when the carriages were rolling up and the lights were gleaming brightly in the decorated halls, he went across to the professors, his heart beating high with expectation. The company was both numerous and brilliant. Olympia was richly and tastefully dressed. One could not but admire her figure and the regular beauty of her features. 
the striking inward curve of her back, as well as the wasp-like smallness of her waist, appeared to be the result of too tight lacing. There was something stiff and measured in her gait and bearing that made an unfavorable impression upon many. It was ascribed to the constraint imposed upon her by the company. The concert began. Olympia played on the piano with great skill and sang as skillfully an aria di bravura in a voice which was, if anything, almost too sharp but clear as glass bells. Nathaniel was transported with delight. He stood in the background farthest from her and owing to the blinding lights could not quite distinguish her features. So, without being observed, he took Coppola's glass out of his pocket and directed it upon the beautiful Olympia. Oh, then he perceived how her yearning eyes sought him, how every note only reached its full purity in a loving glance which penetrated to and inflamed his heart. Her artificial roulades seemed to him to be the exultant cry towards heaven of the soul refined by love. And when at last, after the cadenza, the long trill rang shrilly and loudly through the hall, he felt as if he were suddenly grasped by burning arms and could no longer control himself. He could not help shouting aloud in his mingled pain and delight, Olympia! All eyes were turned upon him. Many people laughed. The face of the cathedral organist wore a still more gloomy look than it had done before, but all he said was, Very well. The concert came to an end, and the ball begun. Oh, to dance with her, with her! That was now the aim of all Nathaniel's wishes, of all his desires. But how should he have courage to request her, the queen of the ball, to grant him the honor of a dance? And yet he couldn't tell how it came about. Just as the dance began, he found himself standing close beside her, nobody having as yet asked her to be his partner. So, with some difficulty, stammering out a few words, he grasped her hand. It was cold as ice. He shook with an awful, frosty shiver. But, fixing his eyes upon her face, he saw that her glance was beaming upon him with love and longing. And, at the same moment, he thought that the pulse began to beat in her cold hand and the warm lifeblood to course through her veins. And passion burned more intensely in his own heart also. He threw his arm round her beautiful waist and whirled her round the hall. He had always thought that he kept good and accurate time in dancing, but from the perfectly rhythmical evenness with which Olympia danced and which frequently put him quite out, he perceived how very faulty his own time really was. Notwithstanding, he would not dance with any other lady, and everybody else who approached Olympia to call upon her for a dance, he would have liked to kill on the spot. This, however, only happened twice. To his astonishment, Olympia remained after this without a partner, and he failed not on each occasion to take her out again. If Nathaniel had been able to see anything else except the beautiful Olympia, there would inevitably have been a good deal of unpleasant quarrelling and strife. For it was evident that Olympia was the object of the smothered laughter only with difficulty suppressed, which was heard in various corners amongst the young people, and they followed her with very curious looks.
but nobody knew for what reason. Nathaniel, excited by dancing and the plentiful supply of wine he had consumed, had laid aside the shyness which, at other times, characterized him. He sat beside Olympia, her hand in his own, and declared his love enthusiastically and passionately in words which neither of them understood, neither he nor Olympia. And yet, she perhaps did, for she sat with her eyes fixed unchangeably upon his, sighing repeatedly, Ach, ach, ach. Upon this, Nathaniel would answer, Oh, you glorious heavenly lady, you ray from the promised paradise of love. Oh, what a profound soul you have. My whole being is mirrored in it. And a good deal more in the same strain. But Olympia only continued to sigh. Ach, ach, again and again. Professor Spallanzani passed by the two happy lovers once or twice and smiled with a look of peculiar satisfaction. All at once it seemed to Nathaniel, albeit he was far away in a different world, as if it were growing perceptibly darker down below at Professor Spallanzani's. He looked about him and to his very great alarm became aware that there were only two lights left burning in the hall, and they were on the point of going out. The music and dancing had long ago ceased. We must part, part, he cried, wildly and despairingly. He kissed Olympia's hand. He bent down to her mouth, but ice-cold lips met his burning ones. As he touched her cold hand, he felt his heart thrilled with all. The legend of the dead bride shot suddenly through his mind, but Olympia had drawn him closer to her, and a kiss appeared to warm her lips into vitality. Professor Spallanzani strode slowly through the empty apartment, his footsteps giving a hollow echo. And his figurehead, as the flickering shadows played about him, a ghostly, awful appearance. Do you love me? Do you love me, Olympia? Only one little word. Do you love me? whispered Nathaniel, but she only sighed. Ach, ach, as she rose to her feet. Yes, you are my lovely, glorious star of love, said Nathaniel and will shine forever, purifying and ennobling my heart. Ach, ach, replied Olympia as she moved along. Nathaniel followed her. They stood before the professor. You have had an extraordinarily animated conversation with my daughter, said he, smiling. Well, well, my dear Mr. Nathaniel, if you find pleasure in talking to this stupid girl, I'm sure I shall be glad for you to come and do so. Nathaniel took his leave, his heart singing and leaping in a perfect delirium of happiness. During the next few days, Spallanzani's ball was the general topic of conversation. Although the professor had done everything to make the thing a splendid success, yet certain gay spirits related more than one thing that had occurred, which was quite irregular and out of order. They were especially keen on pulling Olympia to pieces for her taciturnity and rigid stiffness. In spite of her beautiful form, they alleged that she was hopelessly stupid. And in this fact, they discerned the reason why Spallanzani had so long kept her concealed from publicity. Nathaniel heard all this with inward wrath. But, nevertheless, 
he held his tongue. For, thought he, would it indeed be worth while to prove to these fellows that it is their own stupidity which prevents them from appreciating Olympia's profound and brilliant parts? One day Siegmund said to him, Pray, brother, have the kindness to tell me how you, a sensible fellow, came to lose your head over that Miss Wax face, that wooden doll across there. Nathaniel was about to fly into a rage, but he recollected himself and replied, Tell me, Siegmund, how came it that Olympia's divine charms could escape your eye? so keenly alive as it always is to beauty, and you acute perception as well. But heaven be thanked for it, otherwise I should have had you for a rival, and then the blood of one of us would have had to be spilt. Siegmund, perceiving how matters stood with his friend, skilfully interposed and said, after remarking that all argument with one love about the object of his affections was out of place. Yet it's very strange that several of us have formed pretty much the same opinion about Olympia. We think she is, you won't take it ill, brother, that she is singularly statuesque and soulless. Her figure is regular, and so are her features. That can't be gainsaid, and if her eyes were not so utterly devoid of life, I may say, of the power of vision, she might pass for a beauty. She is strangely measured in her movements. They all seem as if they were dependent upon some wound-up clockwork. Her playing and singing has the disagreeably perfect but insensitive time of a singing machine, and her dancing is the same. We felt quite afraid for this Olympia, and did not like to have anything to do with her. She seemed to us to be only acting like a living creature, and as if there was some secret at the bottom of it all. Nathaniel did not give way to the bitter feelings which threatened to master him as these words of Siegmund's. He fought down and got the better of his displeasure, and merely said very earnestly, You cold, prosaic fellows may very well be afraid of her. It is only to its like that the poetically organized spirit unfolds itself. Upon me alone did her loving glances fall, and through my mind and thoughts alone did they radiate. And only in her love can I find my own self again? Perhaps, however, she doesn't do quite right not to jabber a lot of nonsense and stupid talk like other shallow people. It is true, she speaks, but few words, but the few words she does speak are genuine hieroglyphs of the inner world of love and of the higher cognition of the intellectual life revealed in the intuition of the eternal beyond the grave. But you have no understanding for all these things, and I am only wasting words. God be with you, brother, said Siegmund very gently, almost sadly. But it seems to me that you are in a very bad way. You may rely upon me, if all. No, I can't say any more. It all at once dawned upon Nathaniel that his cold, prosaic friend, Siegmund, really and sincerely wished him well, and so he warmly shook his proffered hand. Nathaniel had completely forgotten that there was a Clara in the world whom he had once loved, and his mother and Lofer. They all had vanished from his mind. He lived for Olympia alone. He sat beside her every day for hours together, rhapsodizing about his love and sympathy and kindled into life, and about psychic 
elective affinity, all of which Olympia listened to with great reverence. He fished up from the very bottom of his desk all the things that he had ever written, poems, fancy sketches, visions, romances, tales, and the heap was increased daily with all kinds of aimless sonnets, stanzas, canzonets. All these he read to Olympia hour after hour without growing tired. But then he had never had such an exemplary listener. She neither embroidered nor knitted. She did not look out of the window or feed a bird or play with a little pet dog or a favorite cat. Neither did she twist a piece of paper or anything of that kind round her finger. She did not forcibly convert a yawn into a low-affected cough. In short, she sat hour after hour with her eyes bent unchangeably upon her lover's face, without moving or altering her position, and her gaze grew more ardent and more ardent still. And it was only when at last Nathaniel rose and kissed her lips, or her hand, that she said, Ach, ach, and then, Good night, dear. Arrived in his own room, Nathaniel would break out with, Oh, what a brilliant, what a profound mind! Only you, you alone, understand me. And his heart trembled with rapture when he reflected upon the wondrous harmony which daily revealed itself between his own and his Olympia's character. For he fancied that she had expressed in respect to his works and his poetic genius the identical sentiments which he himself cherished deep down in his own heart in respect to the same, and even as if it was his own heart's voice speaking to him. And it must indeed have been so, for Olympia never uttered any other words than those already mentioned. And when Nathaniel himself, in his clear and sober moments, as for instance, directly after waking in the morning, thought about her utter passivity and taciturnity, he only said, What are words but words? The glance of her heavenly eyes says more than any tongue of earth. And how can, anyway, a child of heaven accustom herself to the narrow circle which the exigencies of a wretched mundane life demand? Professor Balanzani appeared to be greatly pleased at the intimacy that had sprung up between his daughter Olympia and Nathaniel, and showed the young man many unmistakable proofs of his good feeling towards him. And when Nathaniel ventured at length to hint very delicately at an alliance with Olympia, the professor smiled all over his face at once, and said he should allow his daughter to make a perfectly free choice. Encouraged by these words, and with the fire of desire burning in his heart, Nathaniel resolved the very next day to implore Olympia to tell him frankly, in plain words, what he had long read in her sweet loving glances, that she would be his forever. He looked for the ring, which his mother had given him at parting. He would present it to Olympia as a symbol of his devotion and of the happy life he was to lead with her from the time onwards. Whilst looking for it, he came across his letters from Clara and Lothair. He threw them carelessly aside, found the ring, put it in his pocket and ran across to Olympia. While still on the stairs, in the entrance passage, he heard an extraordinary hubbub. The noise 
seemed to proceed from Spallanzani's study. There was a stamping, a rattling, pushing, knocking against the door, with curses and oaths intermingled. Leave hold! Leave hold! You monster! You rascal! Stake your life and honour upon it! Ha, 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 ha! That was not our wager! I, I made the eyes! I, the clockwork! Go to the devil with your clockwork, you damn dog of a watchmaker! Be off! Satan! Stop you, paltry turner! You infernal beast! Stop! Be gone! Ah, let me go! The voices, which were thus making all this racket and rumpus, were those of Spallanzani and the fearsome Coppelius. Nathaniel rushed in, impelled by some nameless dread. The professor was grasping a female figure by the shoulders. The Italian Coppola held her by the feet and they were pulling and dragging each other backwards and forwards, fighting furiously to get possession of her. Nathaniel recoiled with horror on recognizing that the figure was Olympia. Boiling with rage, he was about to tear his beloved from the grasp of the madman, when Coppola, by an extraordinary exertion of strength, twisted the figure out of the professor's hands and gave him such a terrible blow with her that he reeled backwards and fell over the table all amongst the files and retorts, the bottles and glass cylinders which covered it. All these things were smashed into a thousand pieces. But Coppola threw the figure across his shoulder and, laughing shrilly and horribly, ran hastily down the stairs. The figure's ugly feet hanging down and banging and rattling like wood against the steps. Nathaniel was stupefied. He had seen only too distinctly that in Olympia's pallid waxed face there were no eyes, merely black holes in their stead. She was an inanimate puppet. Spallanzani was rolling on the floor. The pieces of glass had cut his head and breast and arm. The blood was escaping from him in streams. But he gathered his strength together by an effort. After him, after him, what do you stand staring there for? Coppelius, Coppelius, he's stolen my best automaton, at which I've worked for twenty years. State my life upon it. The clockwork, speech, movement, mine, your eyes, stolen, your eyes, damn, him, curse, him after, him, fetch me back, Olympia, there are the eyes. And now Nathaniel saw a pair of bloody eyes lying on the floor, staring at him. Spallanzani seized them with his uninjured hand and threw them at him, so that they hit his breast. Then madness dug her burning talons into him and swept down into his heart, rending his mind and thoughts to shreds. Ah, 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 fire wheel, fire wheel, spin around, fire wheel, merrily, merrily, ah, ah, wooden doll, spin around, pretty wooden doll. And he threw himself up on the professor, clutching him fast by the throat. He would certainly have strangled him, had not several people, attracted by the noise, rushed in and torn away the madman. And so, they saved the professor, whose wounds were immediately dressed. Siegmund, with all his strength, was not able to subdue the frantic lunatic, who continued to scream in a dreadful way, Spin around, wooden doll! and to strike out right and left 
with his doubled fists. At length, the united strength of several succeeded in overpowering him by throwing him on the floor and binding him. His cries passed into a brutish bellow that was awful to hear, and thus raging with the harrowing violence of madness, he was taken away to the madhouse. Before continuing my narration of what happened further to the unfortunate Nathaniel, I will tell you, indulgent reader, in case you take any interest in that skillful mechanician and fabricator of automata, Spallanzani, that he recovered completely from his wounds. He had, however, to leave the university, for Nathaniel's fate had created a great sensation, and the opinion was pretty generally expressed that it was an imposture altogether unpardonable to have smuggled a wooden puppet instead of a living person into intelligent tea circuits. For Olympia had been present at several this success. Lawyers called it a cunning piece of knavery, and all the harder to punish since it was directed against the public, and it had been so craftily contrived that it had escaped unobserved by all except a few preternaturally acute students, although everybody was very wise now and remembered to have thought of several facts which occurred to them as suspicious. But these latter could not succeed in making out any sort of a consistent tale. For was it, for instance, a thing likely to occur to anyone as suspicious that, according to the declaration of an elegant bow of these tea parties, Olympia had, contrary to all good manners, sneezed oftener than she had yawned? The former must have been, in the opinion of this elegant gentleman, the winding up of the concealed clockwork. It had always been accompanied by an observable creaking, and so on. The professor of poetry and eloquence took a pinch of snuff, and, slapping the lid to and clearing his throat, said solemnly, My most honourable ladies and gentlemen, don't you see then where the rub is? The whole thing is an allegory, a continuous metaphor. You understand me? Sabienti sat. But several most honourable gentlemen did not rest satisfied with this explanation. The history of this automaton had sunk deeply into their souls, and an absurd mistrust of human figures began to prevail. Several lovers, in order to be fully convinced that they were not paying court to a wooden puppet required that their mistress should sing and dance a little out of time, should embroider or knit or play with their little pug, etc., when being read to. But above all things else that she should do something more than merely listen, that she should frequently speak in such a way as to really show that her words presupposed as a condition some thinking and feeling. The bonds of love were in many cases drawn closer in consequence, and so of course became more engaging. In other instances they gradually relaxed and fell away. I cannot really be made responsible for it, was the remark of more than one young gallant. At the tea gatherings, everybody, in order to ward off suspicion, yawned to an incredible extent and never sneezed. Spallanzani was obliged, as has been said, to leave the place in order to escape a criminal charge of having fraudulently imposed an automaton upon human society. Coppola, too, had also disappeared. When 
Nathaniel awoke. He felt as if he had been oppressed by a terrible nightmare. He opened his eyes and experienced an indescribable sensation of mental comfort, whilst a soft and most beautiful sensation of warmth pervaded his body. He lay on his own bed in his own room at home. Clara was bending over him, and at a little distance stood his mother and Lofair. At last, at last, oh, my darling Nathaniel, now we have you again. Now you are cured of your grievous illness. Now you are mine again. And Clara's words came from the depths of her heart, and she clasped him in her arms. The bright, scalding tears streamed from his eyes. He was so overcome with mingled feelings of sorrow and delight, and he gasped forth, My Clara, my Clara! Siegmund, who had staunchly stood by his friend in this hour of need, now came into the room. Nathaniel gave him his hand. My faithful brother, you have not deserted me. Every trace of insanity had left him, and in the tender hands of his mother and his beloved and his friends, he quickly recovered his strength again. Good fortune had in the meantime visited the house. A niggardly old uncle, from whom they had never expected to get anything, had died, and left Nathaniel's mother not only a considerable fortune, but also a small estate, pleasantly situated not far from the town. There they resolved to go and live, Nathaniel and his mother, and Clara, to whom he was now to be married, and Lofair. Nathaniel was become gentler and more childlike than he had ever been before, now began really to understand Clara's supremely pure and noble character. None of them ever reminded him, even in the remotest degree, of the past. But when Siegmund took leave of him, he said, By heaven, brother, I was in a bad way, but an angel came just at the right moment and led me back up on the path of light. Yes, it was Clara. Siegmund would not let him speak further, fearing lest the painful recollections of the past might arise too vividly and too intensely in his mind. The time came for the four happy people to move to their little property. At noon they were going through the streets. After making several purchases, they found that the lofty tower of the townhouse was throwing its giant shadows across the market place. Come, said Clara, let us go up to the top once more and have a look at the distant hills. No sooner said than done. Both of them, Nathaniel and Clara, went up the tower. Their mother, however, went on with the servant girl to their new home, and Lothair, not feeling inclined to climb up all the many steps, waited below. There the two lovers stood arm in arm on the topmost gallery of the tower and gazed out into the sweet-scented wooded landscape, beyond which the blue hills rose up like a giant city. Oh! Do look at the strange little grey bush. It looks as if it were actually walking towards us, said Clara. Mechanically, he put his hand into his side pocket. He found Coppola's perspective and looked for the bush. Clara stood in front of the glass. Then a convulsive thrill shot through his pulse and veins, pale as a corpse. He fixed his staring eyes upon her, but soon it began to roll, and a fiery current flashed and sparkled in them, and he yelled fearfully, like a hunted animal, leaping 
up high in the air and laughing horribly at the same time, began to shout in a piercing voice, Spin around, wooden doll, spin around, wooden doll! With the strength of a giant, he laid hold upon Clara and tried to hurl her over. But in an agony of despair, she clutched fast hold of the railing that went round the gallery. Lothair heard the madman raging and Clara's scream of terror. A fearful presentment flashed across his mind. He ran up the steps. The door of the second flight was locked. Clara's scream for help rang out more loudly. Mad with rage and fear, he threw himself against the door, which at length gave away. Clara's cries were growing fainter and fainter. Help! Save me! Save me! And her voice died away in the air. She is killed! Murdered by that madman! shouted Lothair. The door to the gallery was also locked. Despair gave him the strength of a giant. He burst the door off its hinges. Good God! There was Clara in the grasp of the madman Nathaniel, hanging over the gallery in the air. She only held to the iron bar with one hand. Quick as lightning, Lothair seized his sister and pulled her back, at the same time dealing the madman a blow in the face with his doubled fist, which sent him reeling backwards, forcing him to let go his victim. Lothair ran down with his insensible sister in his arms. She was saved. But Nathaniel ran round and round the gallery, leaping up in the air and shouting, Spin around, fire wheel, spin around, fire wheel! The people heard the wild shouting, and a crowd began to gather. In the midst of them towered the advocate, Coppelius, like a giant. He had only just arrived in a town and had gone straight to the marketplace. Some were going up to overpower and take charge of the madman, but Coppelius laughed and said, Ha 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 ha, wait a bit, he will come down of his own accord. And he stood gazing upwards, along with the rest. All at once, Nathaniel stopped as if spellbound. He bent down over the railing and perceived Coppelius. With a piercing scream, Ha! Fine eyes! Fine eyes! He leaped over. When Nathaniel lay on the stone pavement with a broken head, Coppelius had disappeared in a crush and confusion. Several years afterwards, it was reported that outside the door of a pretty country house in a remote district, Clara had been seen sitting hand in hand with a pleasant gentleman, whilst two bright boys were playing at her feet. From this, it may be concluded that she eventually found that quiet domestic happiness with her cheerful, blissome character required, and which Nathaniel, with his tempest-tossed soul, could never have been able to give her.